Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm, um, I'm really pleased to, to welcome you today to the session uh, I am moderating that is entitled Culture, the Missing Link, Strategies for Heritage. So my name is uh, Eugénie Crété, and I'm a, a French uh, engineer working for uh, the International Center for Earth Construction, CRATER, uh, working on uh, local building cultures and uh, their promotions in uh, times of um, post-disaster reconstruction. Uh, so today's session will last 90 minutes and is gathering four speakers that are uh, Anna Highland, uh, heritage consultant at the uh, Lovell Chen based in Melbourne, Australia. Ellen and Michael Madinson, currently working on the management of uh, three museums in uh, Sudan. Maya Ishizawa, a heritage specialist working for the ICROM IUCN World Heritage Leadership Program. And Janaina Well, um, a doctoral student at the University of Campinas, Brazil. So, with uh, our four speakers, we will exchange on how climate change uh, is uh, challenging, our vision of what may be good conservation practices, and what we can learn from uh, our heritage to address uh, climate change issues. So. Uh, the participants' microphones will be muted during the first part of the session, and I invite you to share your questions and comments uh, as they come using the chat box. And um, at the end of each presentation, uh, I would like to dedicate a few minutes for a, um, a question and answer session with our speaker. And at the end of the four presentations, uh, we should still have around 20 minutes to exchange on uh, what we can further get from comparing these uh, experiences and, uh, and yours. So at that time, during the second part of the session, you can uh, uh, virtually raise your hand to be unmuted by the organizers or, and directly share your question uh, and comment. Um, so finally, I would like also to kindly remind the uh, speakers and um, participants that we are welcoming people from uh, very uh, um, diverse countries and ask you to speak clearly and slowly to ease both uh, direct understanding for uh, non-native uh, speakers and ease uh, simultaneous uh, translations that should be uh, in uh, French and Arabic, I, uh, I think. Uh, so thank you for keeping this in, uh, in mind. Uh, so we will first discuss with uh, Anna Highland on uh, how we can uh, anticipate and address the impact of climate change on uh, different heritage sites, uh, using several examples from uh, Australia to understand the benefits and limits of the Bura Charter that has been providing a standard set of uh, practice for the conservation and management of places of uh, cultural significance for over 40 years. So Anna Highland was uh, trained as a lawyer. She has a master's in art curation and she specialized in human rights policy and uh, community engagement. And she currently works as a heritage consultant in the strategic heritage team at Lovell Chen uh, that is based in Melbourne, Australia. So, Anna, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Um, looking forward to having a great discussion with everyone as we as we go along. So, I've got a short presentation to start, and I will just share my screen. As mentioned, I wanted to start the discussion with a really general discussion of what good conservation practice means and some preliminary thoughts that have been sparked by some of my work as a pr practitioner it is a practitioner's perspective and I was really quite inspired by this ICMAS um, document the future of our pasts because it both maps the intersection between climate change and heritage and really starts to acknowledge that there is a need for change in heritage practice, which I think can be quite a challenging concept for a practice, for a 
a field that has generally had quite a conservative approach to change by its nature. As mentioned, I am based in Australia and I should have started a course by um, acknowledging the traditional owners of the land where I live uh, in Northwest Melbourne, the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people and paying respect to them as traditional owners and caretakers of the land. But I must um, acknowledge that here I'm using the Borough Charter as a bit of a shorthand for good practice in Australia. It is a tradition that we have inherited um, from previous documents. It was of course um, adopted in 1979 by Australia ICOMOS as a as an attempt to bring an Australian voice to heritage practice and as in some ways a reaction to the Venice Charter. Um, and it has evolved over time. It's a document, the current model that we use at the moment was published in 2013 and it has a variety of practice notes that expand on some of the topics and provide further information on its application. But the Borough Charter is, has been adopted as, um, as the basis of good practice by Australia ICOMOS and to varying degrees of formality has been enacted um, as the basis for the legislative framework, the legal framework that we operate within in Australia, which uh, in Australia, we have heritage protections at a national level at a state level and then also at a local level and each of those strikes a different balance between uh, understanding what a good and balanced outcome is in a heritage context but all of them are referring essentially to the borough charter process and um, the idea of starting with a thorough understanding of a place and the concept of significance. But in the, um, the context, while the Barrow Charter has provided a, a really robust framework, there it has uh, evolved over time and adopted various ideas from heritage theory and um, thinking along the way. And the question really for me, prompted by that ECOMOS document, is what is good practice in the context of climate change? How might these, these frameworks and processes need to change in the face of very real and very new challenges um, and an accelerating rate of change that we may, that communities are facing in, in from many different fronts? So I've just decided to give a few examples from practice, um, not as case studies so much as provocations to hopefully continue to this discussion with you. So the first idea I have been thinking about is the idea that good press practice must accept the role of mitigation and adaptation as part of good heritage management. And the question there really becomes, I guess, um, an acknowledgement of the increasing severity and frequency of weather events that places might be subjected to. But thinking really in terms of who is that adaptation occurring for? What are the harms that we are trying to avoid? And um, uh, yeah, thinking about the people who are using heritage places and the values that are expressed there. And thinking as well about the aspirations of communities for greater levels of um, mitigation of greenhouse gases and the different strategies for doing those. And in the context, I guess, as well of competing resources, competing um, needs for um, scarce resources, thinking of the ways that we might document and understand the cost effectiveness of various measures and the kinds of adaptations and mitigation that might be achievable through heritage places. The next 
issue that I've been thinking through is the understanding of the role of heritage within the socioeconomic transitions that are occurring as a result of climate change and climate um, mitigation in attempts. And this slide here is a, it is a slide of a heritage place, but it's a heritage place that reflects the reliance of Victoria, the state that I'm in, on fossil fuel industries and the growth of brown coal extraction and power generation after World War II. I think it is a place that um, really raises questions about the role of heritage for communities, for those communities that are facing really extreme social transitions as um, this locate this site, the Morwell Power Station is located in the Latrobe Valley, which is an area with the shutting down of coal plants is really facing big challenges in terms of an economic transition to a, a less carbon intensive future. And I'm interested in the, in the role of heritage within those kinds of transitions and those think, the thinking that communities are doing about their future, their future vision of the places where they live. This image here is of the Great Ocean Road at Apollo Bay. And this is one, a very vast heritage site. It's a, um, a tourist, very popular tourist destination and a road that historically was built as a memorial to return and was built by return soldiers. Um, so it has historical, recognized historical and memorial value and also social value in terms of an early uh, tourist attraction and it is protected at, by multiple um, pieces of legislation at national uh, state and local level and it contains with it is actually a, a region it it contains within it multiple heritage valleys some of them with connections to that story but some of them um, with connections to other stories most importantly the the aboriginal cultural heritage of the Wadarong and Eastern Ma peoples. And it really is a complex heritage site that by the very nature of this coastal tourist route, it is very um, subject to the dynamic, um, the dynamic weather and coastal forces that are, um, that are at play at, in coastal regions. It also tra it traverses towns as we can see here, but it also traverses forests and places of great natural beauty and natural in ecological importance. And the challenge here, um, th this is a very early, in the very early stages of regional planning for this region and thinking about the heritage, what heritage inputs need to go into that regional planning that has been um, that will be undertaken. And the challenge here is about understanding heritage at multiple scales and multiple, I guess, spatial time, spatial and geographical scales and understanding the, um, the what good pra heritage practice means for the immediate challenges that this area is facing, but also looking into the future and what are acceptable levels of physical change that we could expect that might help to promote and protect the values that the community holds in this region. Just on a micro level, again, this, this boathouse is a, within this um, same Great Ocean Road region. And I, I put this slide here because I think one more challenge that one last challenge I'd like to mention in relation to good heritage practice is the ability to recognize and manage conflicts, especially as they increase within, with the pressures of climate change. And the conflicts I'm talking about here, um, as you can see, this is a boathouse that's located in on a river. It's actually an estuarine environment, which is a very high ecological value in itself. And it's also, where the, um, the estuary meets the sea is also an area of, of very 
high Aboriginal cultural heritage value that we could expect will only increase as we um, invest as investigations continue in that area. It's uh, an area which traditionally has been managed by artificially opening the estuary in flood events, but as those flood events increase, and as our knowledge of the environmental and Aboriginal cultural heritage values in this place increase, we could expect that there may be a need to manage that conflict between the actions that are taken to protect this Victorian boathouse at the moment and the other values that are inherent in this landscape. So just in summary, I would say that the challenges here are really about uh, re-engagement with the principles of the Abara Charter, recognising that they're not set in stone, to, but something to engage with and to challenge. Um, I think there's a challenge in terms of addressing exclusion and inequality within society in terms of also what whose values are recognised. And in an, in an Australian context, there's a particular challenge in recognising Aboriginal cultural heritage values in places that have traditionally been under-recognised. I think there's a need for genuine interdisciplinarity and um, really engaging with different forms of knowledge than the, the knowledge that we've engaged with in the past. And I think finally, there is a real challenge in terms of understanding and working with communities, understanding their aspirations, their strengths, resources, and the challenges that they are facing. Uh, and um, as we address heritage management into the future. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Anna, for this presentation. Um, so, um, I, uh, as time is uh, running, I, I suggest that we, we keep on exchanging uh, on this uh, question on the, uh, directly with uh, Michael and, uh, and Helen. So, um, so let me thank you once again for this uh, first presentation on, uh, on uh, the anticipation of the impacts of uh, climate change on uh, heritage sites. And uh, let me invite uh, Ellen and Michael to, to uh, keep on exchanging on this question and also further explore uh, a second major stake that is, uh, how can we better learn from uh, our heritage to tackle uh, climate change uh, issues? So, um, Helen has a PhD in Humanities and Cultural Studies, and uh, she's currently the project manager for the Western Sudan Community Museum project. She works with uh, Michael, who has been working as an architect on several heritage sites uh, protection for more than uh, 30 years. And the project they are presenting today focuses on uh, community involvement in uh, heritage development and on uh, raising awareness on what uh, you call the green heritage agenda. So please, Ellen and Michael, if you can share your presentation and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, hello and, and, and welcome. Um, we are speaking uh, on behalf of uh, the National Corporation of Antiquities Museums and Sudan. in Sudan. And we're sorry that they're not here with us today and presenting this, but um, it, um, the internet at the moment in Khartoum is challenged quite a lot by the problem that every time there's a demonstration day, the internet gets cut and therefore it's almost impossible for them to get involved in any regular presentations of this kind. So we're speaking on behalf of uh, Eglala Malik, the project director for NCAM, mm -hmm. Alia al Nabi, who is the director of the National Corporation of oh. Museums. Yeah, so, ju so to just to give a quick introduction before we do the presentation, um, the Western Sudan Community Museum project is a project that grew out of um, projects in Sudan that National Corporation have been doing to try and involve the communities in understanding and protecting their heritage. Um, and the area of Western Sudan is very underrepresented and the, um, represents actually three quarters of, of the area of Sudan, the area which most heritage is studied is in the Nile Valley where most people in Sudan don't live. Um, and so this is a project, it's an attempt to engage those communities who have been isolated and separated and particularly involving Darfur, which as we know is a conflict area uh, and South Kordofan. 
um, in, the, in the mountains. So these, these difficult areas, which are difficult to reach and for our project very hard to get to, um, uh, have, have been the focus of our project. Um, and the uh, Antiquities Service uh, and um, the Ministry of Culture uh, have been involved in developing this project. So uh, Helen now will give a short presentation. At the end, we'll have some discussion. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay, but do I want to get you to the... Um... So just now. Okay, so um, I tried to orient this presentation um, to be strategic rather than a... Um, uh, simple project description um, because there's a lot of material been working on it for four years now and it's due to finish soon the next couple of months ish depending on how the situation unfolds in Sudan and the discussion point that um, we want to raise is about museums and about the uh, what museums can do vis-a-vis -vis, uh, climate change because obviously that's we're working on museums so, insofar as museums represent our cultural values, how fit for purpose are they regarding the questions of climate, culture, and peace? Well, can you move this out of the way? Sorry. Whilst it's clear that culture is often missing in the discussion of climate change, what's less clear, I think, is how our key cultural institutions take up the challenge. Does the focus of the traditional museum on the object inherently shift attention away from the context that produces them? Can museums rather help protect living cultural landscapes in some way? Next. So our case study really then is um, the Western Sudan Community Museums. The project starts started in 2011. It's due to finish soon. It involves three in 18. <laughs> It involves three existing museums, and they're located on a Western trajectory. And the background here is that the international heritage industry has thus far focused on archaeological sites located along the Nile and the artifacts they make available for museums worldwide, as well as, of course, the Sudanese. And this has had a marked effect on the institutional landscape. Our three museums are not part of next not part of the international um, mission map. They can't survive off tourism either. Darfur is still a red zone and has been for decades. But in fact, this provides an opportunity to rethink how they can best serve their communities. So no, can, can I just explain the map, sorry. Okay, so what you see on this um, map, this is a British Foreign Office advice about where the red zone is, um, I've transposed the Qatar map, so you can see that the sites are all along the Nile in the north of Sudan, and those three diamonds are the locations of our museums. And just to give a quick image of our museums, the Khalifa House uh, on the left is a historic monument. Um, the Sheikh Khan Museum in the middle was built just after independence. And the Darfur Museum on the right was built as a peace gesture in 2006 and shut two years later because of the continuing conflict. Um, what's interesting about our three museums is that they are within the climatic region of the Sahel. And this Pan-African zone has been a scene of human activity since humans began. Next. More recently, it's become identified as one of the world's most volatile conflict zones. It doesn't take much historical research to see why. Uh, the slave trade colonization are clearly big factors. And Western Sudan, which is our um, dot, yellow dot uh, on the left, right. or right, no, left. Okay. <laughs> Um, has been marginalized uh, since it lost its uh, kingdom of the Darfur um, uh, economically, politically, and culturally ever since. And the Sahel has been identified as one of the world's re world regions most vulnerable to the effects of climate change. And this is partly physical, and it's partly because it will multiply existing problems um, and lead to more conflict and more migration. 
community. Um, the commitment of the Sudanese to peace is very well illustrated by the peaceful uh, uh, revolution in 2019, which deposed Sudan's uh, dictatorship. And indeed the ongoing peaceful demonstrations against the recent military coup. This activity is community organized and it reflects Sudan's very young, um, young population. So the question becomes, so what can the museums offer not only to the communities, but also this generation. Uh, when we talk to the communities, peace building is the most cited function for the museums in all three localities. And they're deeply aware of their culture and they believe their museums can and should um, help show this. Next. Um, we thought from the beginning that the essential um, task for the project was to involve communities in developing their own ideas for the museums. We're talking about three museums out of 14 that were set up by the Sudanese government over a, over a period. And so they're government run national museums that uh, are part funded by the government, part funded by the state. The funding is um, virtually nothing. Um, so the communities are coming, have been coming in and we've been doing workshops and events, uh, all sorts of different over the four years. They make, have been making new exhibitions, they've been making new exhibits, rebuilding uh, heritage, uh, rebuilding their tents and huts. Um, we've done surveys in Darfur on what are tr the traditional handicrafts and uh, this has all been done by the Sudanese. Um, uh, particularly during COVID, and a, a whole variety of exhibitions about local crafts, art, objects collected by surveys. A uh, very nice one on Kordofan weddings, because despite all the different tribal and religious uh, things in Kordofan, they all <laughs> do more or less the same weddings. And uh, historic on demand rather than just the Mahdi building. Um, the projects involved a huge amount of restoration and repairs to all the buildings and recording the conservation of their um, very neglected uh, artifacts. And of course, this has included lots of training. Um, but what's interesting is that there's three types of collections. Um, because they're national museums, they all have um, antiquities, mostly from the, the missions on the Nile. Um, or the Aswan Dam um, reclamation of Nubian heritage. Um, a lot of the, the, they've all got historical artifacts uh, and these are mostly late 19th century, early 20th century from the Mahdi revolt. And then they've got different amounts of what they call folklore rather than uh, ethnographic objects, which are donated by the communities. Um, so these may be up to 100 or more years old. Um, the process of rehabilitation has offered the opportunity to rethink what each museum could offer, particularly as a civic space, um, because these are in short supply in terms of well-maintained open spaces for the community, and to reappraise the stories told by um, their collections. Also, uh, if you look at the old labels, they are extremely colonial in their references. You know, they're written from a British perspective. Okay. Um, so this, the last one was the opening in, uh, the soft opening in the Sheikhan Museum, and this is a soft opening in the Darfur Museum um, with the objects collected on the Darfur uh, survey. The previous one was the weddings and some photographs from a studio in the 1950s. Okay, green heritage. We've had to do a lot of research to understand uh, what we were doing here. Um, and we assembled a very good uh, multidisciplinary team within Sudan and um, internationally to uh, uh, understand what we were talking about. And uh, we've extensively used the Sudanese uh, first report on the environment, um, which is very comprehensive um, and uh, very enlightening, very good. So these two maps on the, the blue one is the surprising map, because you think of Sudan as a desert, um, of where all the water does flow at different times. 
So this is, you never would never see this map in the, in the sense of uh, all being water at any one time. It's very sporadic. And it becomes a bit more reliable and intense as you move south. What's very important about this map is the kind of horizontal banding. The blue map, you've got this very strong Nile um, uh, river. And in the horizontal map, it makes absolutely no difference whatsoever to the climate. The climate is fed, is this rain fed um, banding, which gives you this horizontal trans African um, Sahel. Um, and as one of the things that's been coming out in the project is uh, the extraordinarily uh, unproductive clash between traditional cultures and the way they inhabit the Sahel and have done for millennia and the introduction of um, a lot of modern agricultural techniques um, and so on. So the culture of Sudan is rooted in its landscape and the livelihoods this landscape has supported. Though extremely hot, the Sahel is rain fed. It has its own ecologies of flora and fauna from forest to grasslands. And you can see in this um, map that that horizontal band is the kind of inhabited band with all sorts of different livelihoods coming out of that. The traditional mainstays of life were, in, were and still are in many regions, nomadic pastoralism and smallholder farming with every variation in between. This has worked with the Sahel ecology over a vast area. I mean, this is the size of Western Europe and a vast period of time. Modern farming and land use has been destructive. Deforestation, desertification, environmental de degradation now blight very large areas of Sudan. And if this continues and is exacerbated by climate change, the effects could be catastrophic. Shared context. <coughs> so this is a picture of <coughs> camel herd is in Kordofan watering his camel and he's actually stuck there because <clears throat> his migration route further south has been closed off by the encroachment of farms because um, the crop yields have been going down due to land degradation so they expand their farms <clears throat> they close, close off the migration routes and there are conflicts um, <clears throat> that um, escalate because a lot of the ad native administration has been um, sidelined. Next. And this is an image of the mechanized co cotton farming in Kordofan, which has cleared all the natural vegetation and all the natural shrubs and uh, trees. <coughs> all the objects in the museums uh, tell aspects of this story. The archaeology demonstrates very clearly that the rain belt was the ones further north. This has nothing to do with climate change, it's all to do with the wobble of the earth. It traces how the limit of how far the cattle and their herders can gather and the cities they establish. So the kind of storyline of the archaeology up and down the Nile, the reason that those Nile sites are where they are, is because the rain belt was once further north. So it's a very slow cycle. Um, and climate change is a different phenomenon. Um, the history collection demonstrates how Western Sudan, Darfur and Kordofan in particular, were central to the story of colonial exploitation and the shockwaves of the Mahdist revolt, um, which uh, turned upside down politics um, on a very international scale. <clears throat> the folklore collection tells a story of how people have found ways to live and create diverse cultures and communities that work with the landscape of the Sahel. The question is, how can they continue to evolve? <clears throat> there are many um, international and practical aid projects working in Sudan and have been for a very long time on the environmental, social and economic problems. Um, a lot of them have been amazing. But aid <clears throat> is inevitably uh, a form of culture in and of itself, and it does have negative aspects. And the critical thing seems to be how well it works with the communities and how well that, 
how well the agency works, you know, whether at the end of the day, the communities are the ones who become the agents and actually <laughs> recognizing that they were the agents in the first place. And this, uh, this politics or this cultural exchange uh, is very badly handled in a lot of uh, cases that, uh, that uh, we, <clears throat> it has problems. Uh, and you could say that museums come in with exactly, or museum culture comes in with its own cultural baggage. Um, <clears throat> the story is very clear in the three museums, in their collections, how they were founded, and in their institutional structure. However, <clears throat> sorry, the fact <clears throat> that the collections in the museums are all Sudanese and that tourism is not the main driver here, provides opportunity. And the community agency, which were, I mean, there was hardly anybody visiting apart from school groups, um, the three museums, when one in fact was one was closed. Um, uh, the community agency is beginning to take shape in our three museums and the, and the Green Heritage exhibition we're working on at the minute, which has due to finish shortly, um, is beginning to extend this process to the cultural landscape that's under threat from climate change and the current state of the environment. Okay, so this is a home, this is a saddle from our survey on display in the Darfur Museum. Uh, and this is a saddle in use, or it's, rather it's not in use because uh, it's a Kamabish camel um, nomad saddle and uh, they can't currently move out of the waterhole where they are at the moment because of the conflicts um, further south. Um, and this is really uh, affecting all of their movements. And of course, um, there's lots and lots and lots of different groups within um, uh, Sudan who have all sorts of different livelihoods, um, but the, the way they heard us, uh, the pastoralists are, um, one of the least represented groups, despite the fact that uh, cattle herding and livestock generally is one of the most important economic um, drivers in Sudan. So it's an example rather than the only case, but it's a good example. Okay. <clears throat> Heritage, you could say, is already in the past. Culture is what we make of it now. Museums don't just protect heritage, they are cultural institutions that can help shape the future. The question we asked our communities right at the beginning um, was what do you want to do in your museums? Not just what do you want to look at, but what do you want to do? Um, and so it was a kind of, it was how can you reimagine these museums which were extremely traditional, a gallery with cases, with labels if you were lucky, to activity centers. Um, and the, what we're hoping now is that the museums will become a forum for extending this uh, question. Next slide. Um, the, the question to what you want to do in your cultural landscape and to, in a sense, rejoin the folklore, um, particularly, but all three collections are relevant, back into their, the landscape that has um, uh, created them because it's their heritage and uh, it is their future. So this is of gum Arabic, um, extremely valuable crop worldwide. The only thing that uh, evaded economic sanctions by the Americans, um, but the Sudanese actually get very little from it because uh, all of the production is done outside. They export the raw product. And this is a, not an English landscape, it's a, a biosphere <clears throat> in the middle of Kordofan where the temperatures are in excess of 40 degrees for quite a lot of the year. So it does have, it can be green, it can be green. Okay, <clears throat> this one's for Michael to go back to that last slide. So um, in, in summary of the, the Green Heritage Exhibition that we're, we're formulating at the moment actually looks at various aspects of what can be the, uh, the future of the communities. 
And obviously climate change affects Sudan in many different ways. Uh, obviously the use of carbon, the fact that Sudan has lost all its petrol resources to South Sudan has actually given a, a major incentive to the Sudanese to start examining how, what kind of energy use their future could be. And what we've been looking at with them is how that can be shared with their current her heritage. And the slide on the right is an example of ideas that have been put forward by the Sudanese current practice, in fact, of how they're starting to integrate uh, new energy forms of energy generation to avoid burning petrochemicals and also to avoid chopping down trees to cook with. And uh, we're actually doing a, a workshop next week to look at how um, these kind of uh, alternative energy sources can be integrated with their, uh, their current way of habiting their environment. And uh, not only nomads, but also traditional um, villages, which are the dominant um, residential form in, in Darfur and Kordofan. Um, um, so we're, we're trying to see how, rather than building uh, in many of the refugee camps, sort of institutionalized boxes, concrete uh, buildings, which are totally inappropriate, looking at how to use the actual current ways of building, which are very suitable for the climate, and integrate with that certain ways of improving uh, the life within the communities while actually sustaining their resources. And this is very important also with peace building, because a lot of the communities want to go back to from their refugee camps, back to the villages they lived in. But of course, they've got used to having resources like electricity and having services, which they have in the villages and the cities. And trying to return back to their villages and bring that with them is a very important part of the process. So though it seems very extreme to have high technology combined, combined with traditional um, activities. In fact, this is something the Sudanese themselves are doing already. And we are actually able to do our project at the moment, despite the fact that it's very difficult to get to Sudan because we are literally running the project on WhatsApp rather on mobile <laughs> phones, uh, which are charged by various forms of electricity when it does become available. So th this, is, this is not us inventing something. This is the Sudanese way of doing things. And, and, and that, and that <clears throat> inventiveness of the Sudanese and that imagination of the Sudanese people is actually what the project is about discovering and trying to show to the world. Um, can I just finish by saying that uh, this project has been uh, run by Ikram Sharjah for the first half of its life and is now run by the British Institute East Africa, uh, for whom we're both very grateful. Uh, I was just going to add that, that, that coming back to the museums, it's, it's trying to, to um, help the museums become uh, forums for these kinds of discussions. That's, that's all we're doing as an exhibition. We're not doing any projects ourselves uh, in any of these places uh, or setting up any of these technologies, but it's, it's seeing the potential of museums to become kind of knowledge centers for the whole landscape, not just for um, the history of the objects in their care. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Listening and, uh, thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Helen and, uh, and Michael. Um, uh, I would like just to remind participants that they can, then they can use the chat box to send uh, questions, but we will uh, take time for discussion uh, after. Um, and uh, I would like now uh, to listen to uh, Maya Ishizawa. Uh, so Maya is an architect and a heritage uh, specialist working on the management of cultural landscapes and nature culture interactions uh, in heritage places. So she couldn't join today uh, and she recorded uh, her presentation, but her colleague uh, Eugene Jo uh, has joined the session and will be the one uh, answering uh, questions. Uh, Eugene and Maya, uh, currently work for the ICROM IUCN uh, World Heritage Leadership Program, respectively as the project uh, program manager and as the Heritage Place Lab project leader. The World Heritage Leadership uh, aims at improving management practices by interlinking culture and nature while taking up people-centered approaches. And um, the program focuses on three areas, uh, effective management, building resilience, and conducting impact assessments. So Maya's presentation will give us the opportunity to understand the Heritage Place Lab project that gathers several teams of researcher and site managers to improve their ways of uh, working together and explore several 
themes of uh, major importance for heritage sites uh, management. So could you please uh, start the video? Hello the video? everyone. I will briefly introduce you to the Heritage Place Lab project, which pilot phase is running from 2021 to 2022 as an experimental platform of the World Heritage Leadership Program, led by ECROM and IUCN in cooperation of ECOMOS, the World Heritage Center and other partners. One of the priority themes we are addressing is how World Heritage Places are being impacted by climate change and how these can be better equipped for adapting to the changing climate and its effects. We want to explore how practice-led research can inform decision-making processes at site level. So, um, okay. First, I'm the only one that cannot uh, hear the sound. Or? We could not say. The sound is coming out okay from my side. Yes, here also. ...that research, practice, collaboration and models of cooperation are not existent. However, in the context of the implementation of the World Heritage Convention, these links are weak. Researchers find difficult to access sites and tend to base their project on academic needs. Site managers do not find the research findings useful for their daily work. Scientific findings are sometimes not applicable to the specific legal and political context of the sites. Many times, research is developed by, by foreign researchers that gather data from communities, but never report back the results to those communities and site managers that care for the sites. The Heritage Place Lab aims at strengthening the existing links and creating new ones in order to enable fluid exchange between researchers and managers. The lab aims to provide a platform for co-creation of knowledge, integrating the networks of international organizations such as UNESCO and the advisory bodies to the World Heritage Convention, ICROM, IUCN and ICOMOS, partners in the World Heritage Leadership Program. With the lab, we intend to test new ideas and start an explorative process, creating and activating World Heritage Research Practice Networks promoting research on the effectiveness of integrated and people-centered approaches to the management of natural and cultural heritage, promoting interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary approaches and learning environments, promoting practice-led research and long-term and sustainable partnerships. We look at exploring research practice collaboration models, strategies and methods that are existing in the World Heritage context creating practice-led research agendas for World Heritage properties based on co-creation, devising processes for building common research proposals for World Heritage properties, and a model useful for other World Heritage places, and disseminating the project outcomes. For developing this initiative, we open a call for research practice teams to join the project. Each research practice team consists of a group of researchers based in one or more research institutions and a group of managers based in one or more managing institutions. We also invited teams to include local community members, indigenous peoples, and other actors that are relevant in the management of their World Heritage Places. The members of these teams have been selected and coordinated by each institution. The idea is that the people who join the lab can convey the message and work as well with their colleagues in their institutions. Eight teams working on World Heritage Places were selected. Asante traditional buildings in Ghana, Antigua Guatemala in Guatemala, Great Zimbabwe in Zimbabwe, Quebrada de Umahuaca in Argentina, Jaipur City, Rajasthan in India, Historic Sanctuary of Machu Picchu in Peru, Okavango Delta in Botswana, and Rukan Notoden Industrial Heritage Site in Norway, bringing a global overview. The priority themes that we established for the lab are cross-cutting and interrelated. We are addressing diverse knowledge systems, dialogues, and their participation in research and management processes at World Heritage Places. We are looking at how diverse knowledge systems can influence the World Heritage System at policy level as well as how we can localize climate change recognizing indigenous and local knowledge, as well as indigenous and local worldviews and understandings of these World Heritage Places. We look as well at understanding how World Heritage Places can benefit 
from diverse governance arrangements, how can formally recognize systems dialogue with customary system yeah. and how this can support more effective management systems. All this considering the interconnectedness of natural and cultural systems. The Heritage Place Lab is testing resources and their development by the World Heritage Leadership Program, the new managing World Heritage Manual and using the methodology of enhancing our Heritage Toolkit 2.0, which give us a framework for developing research priorities for site management. We have designed an incubation collaborative and participatory process based on thematic online workshops where we are focusing on specific aspects based on the priority cross-cutting themes. We have concentrated in analyzing values, attributes, governance arrangements and factors affecting heritage places. The results and discussions of each workshop support the building up of the research agenda for each World Heritage Site and help us identify potential research themes for developing a common proposal among all teams or pairing teams according to their interests and needs. We have proposed a model of collaboration where site management and academia associate in order to collectively and collaboratively identify the research needs for the site, including an exchanging with indigenous and local knowledge. Based on the practical research needs, site research agendas, where research priorities are stated, are being developed by each team in order to help site management decision-making processes providing multiple evidence. Our preliminary findings are that a positive knowledge exchange between researchers and managers providing common grounds and terms to work together have proved useful and productive. Even though climate change has been identified in all properties participating in the lab as a threat, there is a lack of specificity of their impacts or potential impacts on attributes. More research is needed to establish baseline data and monitoring indicators. More imminent factors are impacted, impacting here and now and are management priorities. For example, over tourism or loss of tourism due to the pandemic, infrastructure development that never stops, or urbanization and encroachment that never stops. Perceptions of the impacts of climate change are diverse, depending on the heritage place. Climate change is a disruptive but slow event, ongoing and cumulative, that may be provoking more frequent sudden events. However, there is a need to deal with specific impacts. Communities are constantly challenged by uncertainty. More research is needed on heritage places' impacts. There is a need to localize and find specificities of impact to heritage places, values and attributes, both, both current and potential, in order to find priorities and potential management responses. Governance is a fundamental issue that needs further research for all properties and which will influence in bringing solutions for climate adaptation in heritage places. At the moment, we cannot share yet final results as we will be exploring these topics further in the next workshop we are holding in March. Thank you very much for your attention. So, uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, so, um, I would like now to, to introduce uh, Janaina Well. Um, so her presentation illustrates the uh, fact that there are uh, several perceptions of uh, climate change uh, impacts and that there is a need to listen to all these voices, including the one of uh, indigenous uh, communities that are too often excluded from uh, debates. So Janaina is a doctoral student in environment and society at the State University of Campinas, Brazil, and her research focuses on uh, extra on extractivism uh, in the Brazilian uh, Amazon, that is a massive uh, extraction of natural resources for exportation purposes, and more specifically on its uh, representation and uh, narratives uh, basing her research on uh, national documentary films. So Janaina, please. Can you see it well? Yes. yes. So hello everyone, 
First of all, I would like to thank the Climate, Culture and Peace event for the opportunity, and especially my fellow panelists, Anna, Helen, Michael, Maya, and Eugene, and for their generous and interesting presentations and our moderator, Eugenie. In my communication, I will briefly introduce two Brazilian documentaries on climate change, uh, feed feature indigenous epistemologies and ontologies as the protagonists of their narratives. I ask your permission to read. Um, the climate issues we live in the Anthropocene are centered in, in, so, in the so-called modern science, where there is a choice about which tools, which lexicon, which ontologies and epistemologies can or cannot enter the political arena. In this sense, the big question is how to include actors that come from another epistemologies and ontologies in the political arena so that they can also participate in the decision making process. We are facing a multi scalar and multi level challenge. At a base is the narrative challenge. Who can talk about climate change? What are the narratives heard? Traditional communities, such as indigenous peoples, are systematically excluded from the debate. They are usually represented and restricted to the axis of vulnerability as victims. And yes, they are victims, like all human beings and non-human beings that inhabit the planet. But they are also producers of knowledge about climate change and have proposals for action on these issues. And not the least, they are not responsible for climate change. It is therefore necessary to make room for these voices to be able to speak and to listen to them. Documentary cinema appears as a potential tool for these narratives to be told and reach audiences beyond the local sphere. The subject of climate change has been increasingly seen in documentary productions, especially since the turn of the millennium. Most documentaries that address the issues of climate change and its effects on the planet are anchored in scientific discourses, although they often bring local examples. More recently, narratives have emerged that bring local experiences to the foreground. Um, and these are the narratives that interest us. So um, here I will present two Brazilian documentaries, Para Onde Foram as Andorinhas, Where Did the Swallows Go, and Quentura, Heat, both directed by Brazilian uh, documentary filmmaker Mari Correa. These documentaries construct their narratives from an indigenous perspective. There are two points in these two documentaries that are interesting to highlight. First, the construction of narratives occurs through listening. We are invited to listen and to learn from other ways of living and knowing the world. The listening place of the director, who is a non-indigenous person, is the place that the audience occupies. The narrative is addressed to the non-indigenous audience. And second, the production process of these narratives is collaborative. The director has uh, been working with indigenous filmmaking workshops since the late uh, 90s. So not only the narratives about climate change displaced from the techno scientific logic, but the mode of the production of these narratives are also horizontal, collaborative. Both films can be found on the internet with subtitles. Here are the links if you want. Um, Uh, the documentary, um, Where Did the Swallows Go?, takes place inside the um, indigenous Xingu Park in the state of Mato Grosso, the first and largest demarcated indigenous territory in Brazil, where more than 7,000 indigenous people from uh, 16 ethnic groups live. It brings the reports of local residents who share with us their perception of the changes in the climate in the seasonal changes of natural events, in the animals, and in the plants. The film has circulated through several film festivals and was also shown in the Paris Climate Conference, COP21, in 2015. 
Here are some frames from the documentary, so you can see a bit of it. Um, some ethnic groups in the region manage the crops with fire, as you can see. Um, well, there is not those ones who are talking with us. One of them states that formerly the traditional practice uh, of fire management was possible, safe and controlled. But nowadays it is the cause of huge fires and that is due to the destruction of the forest by the white people, what have come closer and closer to their territory. Uh, the heat was burned, the scada's eggs. They should be singing, announcing the arrival of the rains and the ideal time for planting their crops, but they are no longer singing. An indigenous person comments to us that is the swallows that bring the rain. And since they no longer come, how they can he identify that the rain is coming? Will the rain come if the swallows don't come? The other documentary is Heat, and it's set in the Western Brazilian Amazon and travels through several indigenous communities in the Negro River Basin in the states, in the states of Amazonas and Acre, and shows the knowledge that indigenous women uh, develop in their territory, as well as the impact of climate change they observe in their lives. The film had a similar trajectory to the previous one, circulating through film festivals and being shown uh, at the World Climate Conference COP24 in 2018, held in Poland. The title, Quintura, which is a poetic way to name heat, makes reference to the heat that has been altering the region and especially the Aru, a cold front that arrives in the Negro, uh, in the Negro River Basin during the winter bringing days of cold, humidity, and fertility to its lands. Large burnings are now common, which bring consequences to their health and to the ecosystem. The crops are drying and rotting, while the volume of bedbugs and other insects has proliferated. The rainfall regime is also altered. Before the position of the stars marked the beginning of the summer, the rainy season. But nowadays the star the stars appear, but the rain doesn't come. So finally, um, both documentaries and the narratives by making an alert and an appeal for changes to the white people. That is to the main public. They ask for structural changes. It is necessary to change our way of living in this world, our relationship with the territory we inhabit, our responsibility towards the future of all beings that share the planet with us. We, the white people, as they say, must make room for other epistemologies and ontologies to participate in the debates and decision-making about climate change. A question left in where did the swallows go? Explain, explains the size of our challenge. Uh, an indigenous man asks, how we will know the time of our history? Uh, you were speaking about the second documentary when uh, it went off. Um, okay, uh, uh, maybe only like to finish. Please. Okay, so finally about the two documentaries, the both that I, I show you a little bit about. Um, both documentaries end with uh, narratives by making an alert and an appeal for changes to the white people, that is to the main public. They ask for structural changes. It is necessary to change our way uh, of living in this world, our relationship with the territory we inhabit, our responsibility towards the future for all beings that share the planet with us. We, uh, the white people, as they say, must make room for other epistemologies and ontologies to participate in the debates and decision-making about climate change. A question left in where did the swallows go explains the size of our challenge. An indigenous man asks, 
how will we know the time of our history if we have already lost the signs that mark time? The white people is changing the time of our history. So that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Janaina. And uh, once again, sorry for the first <laughs> interruption. So uh, let me just very quickly uh, um, ask you, um, all speakers uh, a, a few questions. Um, so um, uh, I found it um, especially interesting that uh, all along this session, um, people-centered approaches uh, were identified as being a, a major element to address uh, climate change uh, issues, whatever your uh, professional backgrounds. And I would like to have uh, your opinions on uh, on how uh, various disciplines uh, and the various disciplines you represent uh, contribute to effectively developing this kind of uh, approaches and how you are dealing with this need for uh, multidisciplinarity and, um, and, uh, and listening to multiple voices uh, on a day by day uh, basis. Um, so does any of you want to speak about this uh, specific point? Uh, we, I, could, I could mention a little bit about the fact that uh, on our project, uh, we have had to work with a whole range of uh, consultants and we focused very much on uh, using Sudanese uh, specialists. And what's been very impressive uh, working in Khartoum and Sudan uh, is the huge range of, of, of specialists in Sudan who have who work on climate issues, environmental issues, um, the, uh, the different biomes, uh, all have Sudanese professors, the ethnographic work, we work with the University of Khartoum ethnographic department and they have very good uh, experts. The archaeology has been processed by the archaeology department. So the, the, the museums have provided a very good platform for specialists within Sudan to speak about their perception of their heritage and their culture. And that's been one of the things that's been most interesting about the project, in fact. And within the actual communities, we've discovered that um, there are large groups of people, volunteers who are interested in helping their environment. We found uh, school teachers who were very keen to the, the, the museums should develop education programs, um, which relate to climate change and to the heritage discovering the heritage. I mean, one of the problems of the um, huge amount of displaced people within Sudan is that people have felt they've lost their heritage because a lot of the heritage, like your man in the Amazon, is associated with the environment they live in and they've been taken out of their environments and forced to live in camps within the larger cities. And all three of the museums are in the largest cities in Sudan. So uh, Omdurman, uh, El Abed and Niala are the three biggest cities in, in Sudan and they have probably 50% populations who are refugees. So we're talking about uh, people who've lost their heritage. And what's been very interesting is that over the last 20 years, a lot of the um, uh, sort of UNESCO, UN groups have had um, various kinds of, of uh, should we say, workshop sessions to try and discover lost heritage. And the museums have been a forum in which they can turn up and, and do workshops. Uh, or do uh, events or do, do something. And that's something which has been very interesting and very useful. And of course, traditionally, the, the, because of the conflict in Sudan, a lot of those um, uh, presentations have been related to the conflicts within society. But now that the, uh, uh, green, the, the green heritage aspect has been raised, uh, they're now beginning to consider how environment affects or change in environment affects the, the conflict within their society. So I would say that the, the museum as a forum actually provides a quite an interesting cross, uh, sorry, cross expertise, we say, but also inter between different communities. And um, one of the directors, in, uh, there's a film that which we, we can send a link for, which uh, about the project. Uh, but one of the directors in this film says that what, what is very nice about the, the way that the project has evolved is that the community within the museum itself, the staff and the people who work within the museum has formed a family which has reached out to the larger family around it. So that the family of the environment which it's living with has participated through the family of the museum. And I think that's a very interesting 
formulation of the Sud of Sudanese culture of how they perceive what is happening. Um, and, and definitely undermines the model of museums which we bring ourselves from outside. Or well, which we found there. Or which, which we found there. To I mean, some degree. <clears throat> they're very different all over the world. <clears throat> there was a, a question in the chat uh, um, that was, uh, how does the, the green exhibition contribute to, to tackling uh, climate change issues and in bringing peace? And um, if you could confirm us, um, uh, during the community's uh, workshop, um, uh, do you manage to gather both uh, host communities and IDPs? Uh, we, and we, we have a very, we, we, I mean, basically the IDPs <coughs> tend to be accessed through the teachers because they are very dispersed. I mean, uh, and, but we have the first uh, Darfur uh, conference workshop we had, there were, there were IDP representatives in the actual workshop. Um, but it, uh, you, you must understand that uh, there are, the situation is quite vol volatile and that um, uh, it's not always easy to access all the different groups all at the same time. So uh, uh, some of the workshops we've done have taken place entirely by the Sudanese. We haven't, be we haven't been at a lot of the workshops. A lot of them are run by the Sudanese themselves in their museums. Um, and occasionally we, one, uh, one workshop was run by the I think it's called the Artists for Peace in Darfur, and they just turned up and took over the museum for about a week, and we didn't even know it happened until afterwards. We got the report. <laughs> so you know, it, it's people. What's happened is we've created a forum which people recognise as being a place they can go to, and because it's sa another thing about it that's we focused on is making it a safe place, so that anyone who comes within the museum is is safe within the environment there. And that they're not that they won't be judged. And they're not part of a. You know, there's not a sort of a government. It's, that is obviously governmental. It is not a government institution in the sense of being a, a court or, a, or some other kind of situation. So actually, one of the, the nice things the museum has provided is a is a space for for meeting and a space for people to hold events and discuss these ideas. And, and we don't actually set the agendas at all in that respect. We 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 ask them to 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 say what do they want to do and then. We see what happens basically and, and if we're lucky we get a, rec a record of what happened um so you know there because there are a lot of institutions within sudan trying to achieve the thing many of the peace ambitions anyhow so um so that that's the starting point from sudan the sudanese perspective is how to deal with community conflict and then the green heritage uh, the green environmental issues we've we've had we've sort of introduced in the last year or so I think the um, just <clears throat> very practically the 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 green heritage is a small pilot project that is currently being funded by the British Council Cultural Protection Fund. So it's the same fund that's running this conference, in fact. Um, and the idea is uh, a, a, an exhibition um, focused on climate change in all three museums. And with the possibility of doing um, outreach versions of it that any institution within Sudan can pick up. So forestry, agriculture, blah, blah, blah. Um, and because of the coup, we've had to do a lot of the basic exhibition um, here and uh, through um, lots and lots of Zoom calls. But we've done the uh, Khalid, who's talking after us, I think, on the next panel, uh, did a survey, took a group out and did a survey and a recording and are making a film about the situation in Kordofan. And the archaeologists are going off to North Darfur this week to survey the archaeological sites in uh, the north of Darfur. So this current culture, antique culture, um, is part of the examples of climate change um, research that they're now embarking on and in a sense all we're trying to do uh, with the two grants we've had or the three four grants we've had from the British Council and from Aleph um, have been to establish the museums for the community to use for however they want to develop the agenda and that it's a focus for their heritage and its protection and as all the apparatus, if you like, of conservation going on. But what the agenda is, 
you know, how they want to develop those interpretations, how they want to deal with um, the, the, the climate issues and their inheritance of both problems and um, culture from the way they live in their landscape is very much up to them. We're not, we're not um, dictating that. We're just trying to bring the resources together in a way that they're useful. Um, we're not trying to tick boxes that we've consulted this or that person. They do the inviting, we don't. Yeah. And, and both the surveys, that with the, all three surveys that have been done were originated from Su Sudanese um, within, yeah. uh, within, the, within the institution. So they, they, they said that this is something that, for instance, we did a... a, a they're, they're doing the peace building, yeah, they, not I mean, us. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the big survey we did two years ago, which was of um, sort of crafts and handicrafts of Darfur, was done, originated out of a desire to try and show how the different uh, tribes within Darfur actually share a common heritage of handcraft making, um, which they didn't know, they didn't realize, or probably were aware of it, but didn't realize how, how strongly that connected them all together because they had different names for the same things. They ate foods, which they had different names for, um, which were made in different uh, in the same way. And so that the, 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 the attempt to present or the different life livelihoods and lifestyles of the Darfur people together in one exhibition was a way of people seeing what they had in common rather than what they had uh, as, a, as, a, as, as an area of disputes. And this, this was something which they wanted to do, which I think grew out of various attempts by peace builders of the last 10, 20 years to try and show people what they have in common. And they wanted to express that within the museum was, was one of the things that they asked for. And that's an, and, and, and a similarity, I said, with the, the green heritage, what's interesting talking to people about climate is they all have opinions about climate because all the farmers, the, the pastoralists, they all know that the climate is changing. They all have opinions about it, but no one ever asks them. Uh, and the, 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 the great success of the first phase of our work, as far as the University of Niala people told us, was that for the first time, people were going and asking people, you know, what do you think is going on and what, what do you think should be done? And they, nobody ever, and some of the villages that they visited had never seen a government official in the, in the previous 10 years. I mean, that's how isolated communities are within Darfur. But, you know, the, 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 the place has suffered from isolation due to the conflict, making it people not want to go there. Um, and as a result, you, you have a very isolated people. Um, okay. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much. And thank you for also insisting on uh, this, the importance of, uh, of uh, listening to, to, to these uh, voices. This is also something that uh, uh, um, Anna, I, I'm afraid Anna is not with us anymore. Uh, Anna Highland, I cannot see her amongst the participants. You lost her, I'm afraid. Yeah, I'm afraid. <laughs> Uh, anyway, this is also something that uh, Janaina, you 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 insisted uh, on, and um, I I wanted. I, I'm afraid we are already <laughs> running short of time, but I also wanted to 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 ask you um, to speak a bit more about the the importance of the the, the film making process itself and um, uh, the about the diffusion diffusion uh, modalities and uh, how it, um, it enables uh, uh, indigenous uh, communities uh, to share their vision and uh, uh, a bit wider and to, to enter uh, scientific debates. Yeah, so thank you. If, you can, if you can just, uh, I, I, I'm sorry, <laughs> if you can take a few minutes to, to, to speak about that and then uh, <laughs> uh, we will uh, uh, end the session with a, a multimedia presentation. So I... Uh, Perfect. Um, no, I think what is uh, important to address is the, to learn from other epistemologies and ontologies is not to only think different, but learn how to do it differently. So yeah. I think the importance of these films are there are alliances with documentaries and, and it's a horizontal process and they are making their own narratives too now. So I think that's both a big change in, in the, this scenario. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Renaina. 
So um, let me invite you to stay in, uh, in this room for the next session. That is a multimedia presentation that should last uh, around uh, 10 minutes, I think. So I leave the floor to Mohana to introduce it. Uh, I don't know if Mohana, you are with us. Yes, you are. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> thank, so you, thank you, Julie. Much, thank uh, you. Uh, to all of you and um, and sorry for uh, for the the really really short question and answer session and I hope that we we will manage to find a way to to keep on exchanging uh, on this subject or in another session or uh, uh, during the um, so thank you very much Mohana please. Thank you so much, Arjuni, and thank you to all the speakers for this wonderful, wonderful session. Uh, to end today's uh, this session, we are happy to share a very interesting multimedia submission called Climate Action Needs Culture uh, by Ms. Isabel Griffin. Uh, a short introduction to her. Uh, Isabel Griffin has a first degree in the history of art from the University of Cambridge. She trained as a wall painting conservator at the Cortland Institute of Art, and she has also a PhD in heritage science. She has spent most of her career as a preventive conservator and conservation manager, working for National Museum Scotland, the National Trust for Scotland, and the National Library of Scotland, be before taking up her current post as head of conservation at National Gallery Scotland in 2019. She's a conservator and her professional activities include chairing the IIC Technical Committee. Uh, and in her role as the head of conservation, Isabel chaired the organization's COP26 working group. I would now like to uh, invite Ms. Isabel to share her remarkable work. Over to you, Isabel. Hi, thanks very much, Mahona. Um, so yes, I work at the National Galleries of Scotland um, and I'm going to introduce the Climate Action Needs Culture film. And I'd like to start by thanking the conference organisers for including it. And I can't stress too much, this isn't my project particularly, it's a project that I was a part of, I'm not the lead on the project, as you'll hear. So the story of the film began just under a year ago, when a group of cultural heritage and arts organisations came together in Scotland to talk about the COP26 Climate Change Summit. And the group was pulled together by an organisation called Creative Carbon Scotland, which advocates for the role of arts and culture in the transition to a more environmentally sustainable society. And to start with, the group was about sharing information. So we talked about funding and other opportunities associated with the COP summit and what we were planning to do for, for COP in our own organisations. And we also discussed the role of arts and culture in engaging audiences with climate change, which for some of us was quite a new way of thinking and a, a new way of working with our collections. And that information sharing was really useful and the collaboration could very easily have stopped there if it hadn't been for the massive energy and enthusiasm that the Creative Carbon Scotland team brought and they proposed that we should work together on a project for COP so we should actually do something rather than just doing lots of talking. And so the project we came up with was making a film aimed at policymakers, which would use Scottish examples to demonstrate that culture can be the secret ally of climate policymakers. Between us, we managed to get a budget of a few thousand pounds and we commissioned Pictures Zero, which is a film company specialising in climate solutions and human climate change stories. We managed to persuade the Scottish Nigerian supermodel actress and activist Eunice Olmeade to narrate, narrate the film and we worked up a script and a filming schedule. So the film was screened during the COP26 summit, firstly in an online discussion event as part of the Scottish Government programme of events and then at the culture reception, which the Scottish government held to mark the end of COP. The copyright for the film is held by Creative Carbon Scotland, but our groups agreed that we're happy to make it available to other organisations that want to use it for engagement. So if after having seen it, you're interested in being able to use it, please just make a request through the Creative Carbon Scotland website. And so to summarise, I think this is a really fantastic film. I hope you'll agree. It's had a great reach already and it will continue to be a really useful resource for us, I think. It demonstrates the value of collaboration, which I'm really happy to report is now continuing apace in Scotland. And I'd like to thank everyone who was involved in the project, but in particular, Creative Carbon Scotland, without whom it probably wouldn't have happened. And so that's all from me, and I hope you enjoyed the film. Thanks, everyone. birth to death, 
The stories we tell shape the way we see the world. Some positive, some negative, some clouded with misinformation. Right now, we're seeing a world that's changing in unprecedented ways. I grew up in Scotland, but my family comes from Nigeria, so cultural heritage means a lot to me. I've also seen firsthand the devastating impact of our changing climate. When the nations of the world come together in Glasgow, what will be the stories we tell of COP26? Reaching net zero in a world adapted to a changed climate will require massive global transformation. Changes to society and lifestyle that for many are hard to imagine. But without culture providing a new positive vision of the future, can we actually create it? The pictures on our screens still reinforce lifestyles which make high carbon living normal and aspirational. These stories need to change as the story of slavery has changed. Without new stories, we risk repeating the mistakes of the past and are failing to adapt to the future. Is culture the secret weapon for climate policy makers? A powerful force to shift society's embedded thinking and transform the status quo that's only working for a small minority. Artists, historians, librarians and curators think differently. They bring different imaginations, skills and experiences that can help other professionals think outside the usual boxes. Art and culture is not only a mirror to hold up to society, but as Brecht said, a hammer with which to shape it. Museums, galleries, libraries and historic environments. These powerful memory institutions help us understand previous transitions in society. They remind us that things haven't always been the way they are today and have the power to paint a new vision of the future. People come together in cultural spaces to explore, learn and think differently. To think collectively. Big cultural spaces can help us think bigger. And small community spaces provide practical knowledge and resources for local adaptations and resilience. Spaces where people learn new skills and rediscover old ones. Where they debate new ideas and share traditional wisdom. Economists, scientists and politicians can't fix the climate emergency on their own. They can't change the way people think. And that's what's required. Climate change needs culture change. And cultural players are waiting to help. Armed with powerful skills, resources and audiences. So let's harness their energy and commitment by bringing culture front and centre to climate policy. Let's use our amazing cultural spaces to support a bold and just transition. Decisions over the next decade will shape the future of humanity. The choice to exclude our cultural resources or embrace them could be the most important story of them all. We thank you so much, Isabel, for sharing this video with us. And uh, the session ends here. Mm -hmm. And we have another session coming up. It's the panel Culture for a Sustainable Future in the Arab region. It will be in Arabic and English. I send the link in the chat. Can the text comments on this one? Oh, yeah.